of the book for today has to do with the fact that if you test a battery with a voltmeter, it will say one and a half volts, and then you put it into your flashlight and it doesn't give hardly any light at all, that it is effectively dead. How can that be? One and a half volts, no juice in the battery. Um, so we come back to that right away. Um, the first thing I want to talk about, though, is the distinction between AC and DC, which refers to alternating current and direct current. And what we're talking about is a current which alternates as a result of a potential difference, which alternates. Um, I could have put an I here, I guess, that the current is first flowing in one direction and then it's flowing in the other direction. Notice the magnitude is also changing um, sinusoidally if this alternating current has been created by a rotating generator. Um, we will talk about that for the years over too. And here is, is what a direct current looks like. It's always flowing in the same direction. Um, not necessarily always of the same magnitude, but we kind of like that. This would be the kind of current and voltage that you would get from this sort of a device. This would be a seat of EMF for direct current, possibly, but not necessarily, a, a, a battery of cells with the chemical reactions happening so that this is always the high potential and this is always the low potential side of the seat of EMF. The symbol for a seat of EMF for alternating current uh, looks like this, and we just sort of have a symbol. How a generator works, something we will learn much later. Um, so, coming back to that dead battery that's giving off one and a half volts, um, we need to look at what's going on inside the battery. That, you know, it's got the high potential and the low potential uh, electrodes, and it will then cause current to flow around but this is a complete circuit. The current is also going to be flowing through the inside of the seat of EMF. Electrons, negative and positive ions, are moving here inside to have those chemical reactions. And as a result, there is some resistance to their movement here inside of the seat of EMF. There is this difference in electronegativity between the um, materials making up this battery, but, but, um, and that is going to determine the EMF, which will not change as long as you have the chain difference in electronegativities. But this will change. As the battery becomes less and less fresh, the, you're going to have more and more reacted reagents and the salts that are produced by them and the acting reagents are going to have a harder and harder time making it to react with the um, with these two plates and and it's going to get harder and harder for them to move around and get to the plates as battery gets older and older if you hook up well okay so we have a a new expression we speak of the terminal voltage. This end A and this end B are the terminals, the outer edges of the, the battery, and this would be the terminal voltage, the potential difference between the two ends, A and B. But that voltage, that potential difference, is composed of both this gain from the seat of EMF and a loss. Since there is current flowing, there will be a loss of potential as you go through this um, resistor. And so the terminal voltage would tend to be less than the EMF. And this resistance goes up and up as the battery gets older and older. And so if you hook up a voltmeter here, it has near infinite resistance. And so it draws effectively zero current 
and so the internal voltage drop is effectively zero. And so what the voltmeter will tell you is that the terminal voltage is the same as the difference in electronegativities between those two elements. It's going to give you one and a half volts. But if you then take that battery, which just said, hey, I've got one and a half volts, and put it into a circuit where this is not infinite resistance, this is a light bulb in your flashlight, suddenly the current is going to become substantial and the internal voltage drop is going to become very large. And so maybe, maybe this is one and a half volts, maybe this is 1.2 volts. And so the terminal voltage would only be 0.3 in that case. I hope that explains the whole. Will you please apply that formula that terminal voltage is equal to EMF minus I lowercase r to do this problem here. Now on to the most important part of this lesson, which is Kirchhoff. And it is so straightforward. It makes so much sense. And yet it proves difficult for people. So stay with me. Um, the first is just Kirchhoff's junction rule. There is a junction where things come together. Join um, is, is just a statement of conservation of mass. It says, as you're going to have as many marbles going into a junction as coming out of a junction. And you ought to be able to tell me how many marbles and in what direction along this path here. Kirchhoff's loop rule is about conservation of energy. It says, if you go around a path and come back to where you started from, then the difference in potential between where you started and where you ended is going to be zero. Along the way, there might be losses and gains in potential, but if you add up all the losses and all the gains, it ought to add up to zero. There is no potential difference between a point and itself. That ought to make sense to you. So let's apply it. Here is a circuit I would like to analyze. And the first thing I need to do is to realize that there are three independent pathways. Here is a tube of marbles. Everywhere along, it has to be the same current. There are no junctions within that purple region. Here is another tube of marbles. No junctions, same current everywhere there, but here is a junction. And so the current could change at that junction. And finally, this tube of marbles. Okay, so first you recognize how many different, uh, how many tubes of marbles you've got. And then what you want to do is to go back and There is one current here, give it a name and give it a direction. And it doesn't matter whether you get the direction right or not. You just need to be explicit about, I say that there is one current everywhere along there and it's gonna go in that direction. And one current everywhere across here, if it's different from that current, give it a different name and give it a direction. And if you got any of these directions wrong, then when you finish analyzing the circuit, the answer will come out negative. And that will tell you that it goes the opposite direction to the way you pointed the arrow. You will know. Okay, first step. Identify how many different currents you have. Give them names, give them directions. Second step, you need to pay attention to the high and the low potential. You might want to even mark it for yourself so that you don't make a mistake. Or it could be that just you know, short is low potential, long is high potential. This current I chose to go to the right here, current <laughs> always flows from high to low potential. And I strongly encourage you to make that mark on your diagram. Again, this one goes from high to low potential. 
it will be a big boon to you to have that marked. Please do it. Ultimately, you just need to get the right answer. But I think it would be very good for you to do that. Okay, so second step, I get very clear about where I've got voltage gains and where I've got voltage drops. Third step is to choose to go around the loop. I'm going to use Kirchhoff's loop rule first. And I need to choose a place to start going around the loop and a direction to go around the loop. I also chose which loop. I could have done the top loop, which I am, the bottom loop, or the big outer loop. You just to know, need to know which one you chose to do, and it would be nice if you made it clear to me which one you chose to do. Now we're going to go around the loop. I start here, and the first thing I do is to drop, go from high to low, drop 10 I1, and then I'm going to drop 2 volts, and then I'm going to gain 5 volts. Pay attention to how you're going around the loop. And then I'm going to drop 20 I2. And then I'll be back where I started from. And so all of those losses and gains ought to add up to zero. No potential difference between the point and itself. Next, I choose to do the bottom loop, and I'm going to, again, do it in a clockwise direction. You don't have to. I'm going to choose to start here. Um, that, that it doesn't matter where you choose to start. You just need to know where you chose to start so that when you get back there, you know that you are done. Again, gain ten, uh, 20 I2. Ah. Here it was a loss of 20 I2, but because I'm the direction I'm traversing it, it's a gain of 20 I2. Loss of 5, not a gain. Gain of 8, loss of 10 I3. And then I'm back where I started from, so it all adds up to 0. Kirchhoff's loop rule. You could also do a loop around the outside. It will give you redundant information. It will not help you. Stop after you've done two loops and go to Kirchhoff's junction rule. You choose. There are two junctions here where wires come together, where currents come together, and here where currents come together. I'm going to choose this one over here. Doesn't matter. It would be well if you would make it clear to me which one you chose so that I can be guided in giving you partial credit. And then I can see that out of this junction goes I1, and into that junction goes I2 and I3, that the currents out must equal the currents in, done. Now all you have to do, I've got three equations in three unknowns, solve them simultaneously. Some of you may have a calculator where you can just put in those three equations, say solve it for me, and it'll do it. Bully for you! The rest of us, using TI-83s and TI-84s, are going to have to use matrices to solve this. So the next step will be to take these three equations and put them in matrix form, a 3 by 4 matrix. Um, so I've got 10 I1s. The first column will be I1, negative 20 I2s, no I3s in this equation, and then here, this, these two constants add up to 3, but I need to move them to the other side of the equality and call that a negative 3. You check out what I did here. And now to solve. What you're going to have your calculator out. Stop the show and get your calculator. Okay, so turn on your calculator. Hit the second button up there in the upper left and then hit the, the key that has matrix on it, uh, matrix up above. And that will get you a, a, a menu that says edit, math, and something else. New. Edit, math, and new. Yeah. Um, 
And, and what you, in fact, want to do probably is to hit New, and then it will ask you what the dimensions of the matrix will be, and, and you will, and, and, yeah, you can take the first one if it's empty, and even if it's not empty, uh, you could write over top of it. Or you could use one of the later matrices. Just remember which matrix you chose. After you hit New, it'll ask you for the dimensions. You want to uh, not edit, but you, you, you put in a, uh, that it's going to be a 3 by 4, 3, Enter, 4, Enter. And immediately after you do that, it will hop to this position right here. And you put in negative 10. Don't say subtraction 10. Use that key on the bottom, that plus minus key. Put in a negative 10, um, and then enter, and it'll hop to this position. You put in a negative 20. If you are writing over top of an existing matrix, you could do edit, and then put new values in, and so on. Put in a 3, enter. Put in negative 3, enter. And when you do that enter, it'll hop right here. So you can put in a 0, enter, 20, enter, and so on. Until you've got the whole matrix in. Then it's a little awkward. You need to hit the second button and quit. Then you need to get back into matrix, second matrix. This time you want to use the math. And when you type math, you'll get a math menu and not visible on the screen. In fact, you can get to it most quickly by scrolling up, but you can also scroll down. Entry B is REF, which stands for reduce row echelon form. And then you need an argument that that function is going to act on. And what you have to do is hit second, matrix, and then select that matrix that you just stored all this stuff in. And then if you hit enter, what you will see is this. There is this matrix in reduced row echelon form, and and it's in row echelon form, and having this extra one here made it reduced row echelon form. Um, <clears throat> this means that current one is equal to three tenths of an amp. Current two is equal to zero. Oh, there's a surprise. And current three is equal to 0.3 amps meaning that I got this one in the right direction and I got that one in the right direction. Now I want you to do it yourself. And you try to go through the steps that we just went through. And the minute you get frustrated, you start the show again. And, and uh, you can see what I'm doing. And then the minute you start to feel confident again, stop the show and try to do it yourself. It is so much more valuable for you to be the one doing it. So first, you identify that there are three independent currents. You give them names and directions. I have lazily chosen the same names and directions as before. Next, you want to be very clear about where the high and the low potential are for the resistors, which would depend upon your choice of the direction of the current. Then you need to choose a loop, and I am going to choose to um, do the big outer loop. So I'm indicating where I'm going to start, and I'm going to go around it counterclockwise, just for variety. And so the first thing I do is I gain 1, and I gain 4, I1. And then I gain 6, I3, and then I lose 23. And then I'm back where I started, so that's all equal to 0. Now I'm going to choose to do the bottom loop. I'm going to start at the same place, go around it the same counterclockwise direction. First thing I'm going to do is to lose 5, lose 5, I2, Gain 6i3, lose 23. 
and all those gains and losses must add up to zero. And then I choose a junction. Um, I'm going to choose this junction here. Just for variety, it has I1 going in and I2 and I3 coming out. Must be as much current in as out of a junction. Then I put that into matrix form. Notice 1 plus negative 23 is negative 22, but move it to the other side of the equality. And then I put that into the calculator, doing all those um, functions we talked about before. And then I reduce row echelon form it, and the result should be that I1 is 1 amp going to the right. If you had had your arrow going to the left, then you would have gotten a negative 1 and you would know that this was what that meant. I2, in my instance, I come up with a negative 2, which means, in fact, it is also going to the right. And I3 is going to the left, as I had guessed, and, and uh, I am done with that problem. I want to return to this terminal voltage where I had said that the terminal voltage would always be less than the EMF, which is wrong. Um, let us consider that the current flowing in this circuit is going to be determined by the EMF. And so when you go from A to B, you are going to have a voltage gain and then a drop. This would be the high potential side. This would be the low potential side. So you do get this drop. Cool. That's what you said before, Mr. Houghton. But please consider the possibility of the current flowing in the opposite direction. How could that be? How could it go contrary to that C to the MF? Well, what if there was another seat of EMF that was stronger than this seat of EMF? Then it would drive the current backwards. This would be, if this was a rechargeable battery, this would be um, the act of recharging. Now, if I go from A to B, I have a gain as I go through that seat of EMF. And, ooh, the positive is going to be over here. I'm going to have a gain in potential as I go through the internal resistance. And so it would be possible for the terminal voltage to be greater than the EMF. This final is a question of why you would ever, if you put two batteries together in series, you get 36 volts. Why would you ever choose to put two batteries together in parallel? You only get 18 volts. Why would you want it weaker like that? Well, let's consider that this has got an internal resistance of 4, 4, that's 8, plus 1 is 9. Current flowing is 4 amps. The power here, external on the load, is going to be current squared times resistance, 16 watts. You could go ahead and do this. I mean, that's 4 and 4 in parallel is 2. 2 and 1 is 3. So the, the current flowing here is 6 amps. And 6 squared times 1 is 36. Oh, look at that. You've got more power here if you hook them up in parallel. What a surprise that if you have a small external load, it may be that, that parallel is best, that making the internal resistance down to 2 instead of an internal resistance of 8 made it better. What about if you have a large external load? Well, that's 8 and 10 is 18. 18 into 36, 2 amps is flowing, 2 squared times 10, 40 watts. Whereas here, that's 2 
plus 10, that's 12. And so the, the current is one and a half and the external load is smaller. So in this case, hooking them up in series would be better. Look, I have more total resistance, but not, it's, it's, it's one and a half times as much total resistance. Here, the, the total resistance was three times as much, but the, the EMF was only twice, and so I was at a loss this time. But with a large external load, hooking them up in series would be a better choice. All right, thank you.